Right, so good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar session on avoiding predatory journals. My name is Lucia Scumbi. I'll be the moderator of the session today. I'm a senior consultant for research intelligence at Elsevier and I'm joining this morning from South Africa. So first of all, I really want to do a, shout, a special shout out to all of the audience. We realize that you receive many invitations to online sessions and we're really honored uh, that you have joined this one. So as I've mentioned, we've had more than 3,000 researchers and academics um, that have registered from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Ghana, um, Kenya, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, as well as some other countries as well. Um, so, you know, this really shows that we have a co collective concern as Africans about this menace. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, on the speakers panel, we are very honored to have Professor Johan Maton and Marti van Niekerk um, uh, at the, of, of the Center for Research on Evaluation uh, Science and Technology at Stellenbosch University, uh, which also houses the Center of Excellence in Scientometrics and Science, Technology and Innovation Policy. Everyone is familiar uh, with the center will know that it is renowned for its exceptional research and guidance on various matters relating to science and technology. Uh, we look forward to your insights today. We also have Dr. Vermeister, who is the Director of Scopus Content, um, who is based uh, at the Elsevier uh, Head Office in Amsterdam. I would also like to welcome other Elsevier team members as panelists who will be assisting with the Q&A today. They are Tracy Chen from the Scopus product team based in Beijing, Mohamed Rahed of the Research Intelligence team in Africa based in Cairo, Dinesh Rimudli, for the Elsevier core content team who's based in South Africa. Uh, the session today will consist of two presentations. We will start with Professor Johan Maton, who will give us some background about the phenomenon of predatory journals. Um, and then Dr. Vermeester will talk about how predatory journals impact Scopus as an international index and what measures are taken to guard Scopus against fraudulent journals. Each of these speakers will have about 20 minutes after which we will invite questions and comments. Please use the Q&A box to ask your questions. But because of the extensive audience we have today, we need to apologize um, ahead already that we will probably not be able to answer all your questions. Uh, the panelists will select between five and 10 questions at the end and we will focus mostly on those. So without further ado, uh, I invite Professor Maton then to start. And I will stop sharing. Okay. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Lucia, can people see my screen? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. So yes. first of all, thank you to Elsevier and specifically to Lucia for this invitation uh, to talk about a topic that is uh, indeed close to my heart. This is a presentation that has been put together by myself and Marty van Nikerk, who also works at Crest. And uh, just um, at, at the beginning of the presentation to say that uh, I've sent this presentation to uh, Elsevier and they are very welcome to share this you will see it on the recording of the session, but you can also get the separate presentation. I suspect that I may have to uh, go through some aspects of the presentation quite fast. So the, the, the subtitle is Concepts, Causes and Consequences. And essentially, I want to talk about some of the terminological issues about predatory publishing, then some of the discussions about what caused, what gave rise to predatory publishing and, and its current uh, continuance, and what are the key consequences of this uh, for individuals and institutions. So I'm going to um, start. I am assuming that most of the people on this call uh, do understand that the notion of predatory journals uh, goes back to at least a, around 10, 2012. There were earlier instances of scholarship that pointed to this phenomenon. But the name of Jeffrey Beale, who was a librarian at a US institution, is usually associated with the origins of the discussion. And he started a website 
around that time. And uh, on this um, slide, you see uh, his initial definition as predatory journals are open access journals that exist for the sole purpose of profit. Um, and he then elaborated on that. I will come back to that. Uh, Beale developed a list of predatory journals and predatory publishers. Uh, he closed his website two years ago and uh, for various reasons, but his original list and further list are still available. So you will see that there's a link at the bottom of this um, a slide that uh, refers to uh, uh, some of the places where you can find it. One of the first things that happened in the uh, subsequent years was that um, people started to debate uh, the definition of what is predatory. And um, you will, um, sorry, you will um, see from this slide that already um, various names have been put forward uh, to, um, uh, to replace the term predatory. Some people argued that the term predatory is not sufficiently clear. Um, other uh, talked about additional terms to use uh, the words like fake uh, or gray or opportunistic journals. So this slide is just to alert you to the fact that there um, was a huge amount of um, commentary in uh, over the last five to eight years about whether one, the term predatory is the appropriate term. And secondly, uh, whether uh, we have a clear enough definition uh, of predatory. Uh, so uh, this um, led a group of scholars based at uh, Ottawa uh, University uh, to organize a summit um, uh, in 2019. And um, uh, uh, we attended that meeting. There were about 40 people there. And for three days, we debated uh, the definition of uh, predatory. And, um, uh, and it uh, ultimately resulted in a statement that uh, uh, you find here. The, uh, I refer to it as the Ottawa Declaration. And um, essentially, um, uh, it was published in Nature uh, and uh, received a huge amount of attention. Um, sorry, I just wanted to do some of my, spread my screen because I can, I see that I can't see my whole screen at the moment. I just want to get rid of um, some of the noise on my own uh, screen. Um, okay, that's better. So this definition uh, was put forward at the summit and it says the following, that predatory journals and predatory publishers, because we have to understand that the term is used to apply both to journals and publishers, are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship. That was pretty much the basic starting point of the definition and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency and the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. Now, in the next few slides, I'm going to just elaborate on each of these uh, five key phrases uh, with some examples. So this is just a summary. So let's talk about the first, seeking profit um, uh, and prioritizing self-interest at the expense of scholarship. So the notion of a predatory journal, if you think about it, is of course a, um, a term that already suggests some form of unethical or fraudulent uh, behavior. And this is captured uh, in most of the definitions and certainly originally by, by Beale. And, um, and it talks about the intention of journals and publishers to deceive authors who submit uh, manuscripts to them in different ways. And so the first slide here talks about some of these things that one I'd associate with priority journals, the deliberate deception of authors by either hiding or not disclosing funds. APCs are author processing charges, handling fees, fast track fees, 
uh, the omission of any revenue related information. Um, let me just point out, because that was already one of the questions we received before the webinar, that uh, predatory journals are not characterized by charging APCs because the business model of most scientific journals in the world today require that they recover some of the production fees of the production of the journal. So the mere fact that the journal asks authors to pay uh, for the production, uh, the processing of the manuscripts the, uh, is not the distinctive feature of predatory journals. What is the distinctive feature of predatory journals is that they either don't always disclose these fees, they hide these fields, fees, and uh, as we will see later, the, the key issue is actually that this is done with the view to get as many, obtain as many manuscripts uh, that are then usually not properly peer reviewed and uh, go through proper editorial processes. One of the um, clearest examples of how a publishing house uh, manipulated and exploited uh, the uh, phenomenon of predatory is a company called Omics in the USA which launched in one year in 2009, 200 journal titles, which is unheard of, simply to be able to secure more manuscripts uh, that people would uh, pay for. Uh, in my view, one of the uh, most uh, robust indicators of whether a journal is predatory or not is about the use, about uh, the, the, the false claims that are made on the website of a journal. And I'll give you one or two examples. But I always tell my students that if you're not sure that this is a predatory journal, look on the website to see what they say about their indexing, where they are being indexed, and whether that's truthful, and whether they use appropriate metrics or fake metrics. Because that, uh, to my mind, is a very clear indicator that you may be dealing with a, uh, a fake or predatory journal. And by that, we mean that uh, journals that are indexed in the top citation databases and indexes in the world, like the Web of Science and Scopus, of course, usually go through rigorous uh, quality control. And the indexing of a journal in either the Web of Science or Scopus or uh, one or two other, the, the directory of open access journals, um, should give you confidence that this is not a predatory journal. But when they claim that they are being that they are indexed in other databases or indexes that uh, do not sound correct, then you have to become very suspicious. Here's an example of a journal uh, that, on, in its invitation that was sent uh, to Marty a few weeks ago, um, recently said at the bottom uh, they are indexed and abstracted. Uh, in Google Scholar, Index Copernicus, Research Bible, WorldCat, uh, etc. Now, let me just point out that <laughs> pretty much none of these are proper um, journal indexes. Uh, the Google Scholar is a search engine, as you know. Index Copernicus is a fake index. WorldCat is a catalog of books, etc., etc. So, I would, when I look at this together with some of the other information that is on this page, including that they would publish within 48 hours, there is no, absolute no question in my mind that this is a, a predatory journal. I know two things about it and uh, you should stay away from it. Um, this is just a, a slide to show you, unfortunately, the proliferation of fake indexes that are used by certain journals, some of them, are legitimate lists like DOAJ and ProQuest and Mendeley, but some of these, uh, like at the bottom, you see uh, they refer to the global impact factor GIF or the universal impact factor. Let me just say from a bibliometric point of view, uh, that is up, uh, utter uh, 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 nonsense because the, the, there are only about three or four proper journal impact metrics that are produced in the world and uh, none of them uh, are the global and universal impact factors. One of the things that is another sure sign that you're dealing with a prejudice is aggressive uh, solicitation of articles. When you get an individual um, email 
that uh, ask you to submit an article to the journal, as I will say at the end, you already have to be slightly skeptical about whether you're receiving this email from a legitimate journal. And the reason why I say that is very simple. And that is that the top journals in the world in any field of science uh, typically would not solicit uh, articles except possibly for special editions. But the top journals in the world get more manuscripts, more submissions than they can deal with. There's no need for them to solicit uh, articles. So uh, we all may have had this experience that on a weekly or daily basis that you get an invitation uh, to submit an article very often within a short period of time. And what they do is that essentially they play on the egos of people to say, and unfortunately also especially of students and young scholars who then feel flattered that they are being invited to submit a paper to a journal. And that is not commonplace in, the, in, the, in, in scientific uh, scholarship. I will give you uh, just uh, two examples. Here's an example of a spam email uh, where basically they uh, they invite you for a submission. If you look at the time schedule at the bottom, they are essentially promising that they will publish within 12 to 15 days. Again, that is in terms of top high quality journals, that is simply not done. Um, and the other thing that you must look out for is the use of business language. The mere fact that they say here in this email, that they would originally charge you, normally charge you 500 US dollars for a manuscript, but you now qualify for a discount uh, and you can only pay $75 and get your uh, article published even before, remember, even before they have seen your manuscript, they are promising that they will publish it once you pay $75. I mean, the publishing world is not like a supermarket where you can get discounts on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, to my mind, there's no question that this is an uh, example. And they very often, even with prayer free publishers, prayer free conferences, they, um, they flatter you, they comment on your exceptional contribution to work. Uh, I'll give you one example, which I personally got a few years ago, uh, which was sent to me. Uh, this is from a prayer free conference because they're also fake and prayer free conferences. And if you read this, um, Email. It starts by very familiar greetings. Hope this email finds you in best health of spirit. We take the privilege to invite you to address as honorable chief guest at the international conference. And it, so it goes on. And you know, when, when we as scholars get these kinds of invitations, which is uncommon in the world of science, where people flatter people before they invite them to conferences, you just have to be very suspicious. Another uh, example of uh, the characteristics of, uh, characteristics of a project journal is the inappropriate journal titles and scopes. So what have we seen is that many of the project journals have a broad disciplinary scope. They combine scientific disciplines. They copy the titles of legitimate journals like Science and Nature. And then they also use words in the title like global or universal or modern, you know, innovative, progressive. And these are, again, not common to standard legitimate journals. Here's an example of that. I will skip this. Here's an example uh, that Marty gave. Uh, you have on the left-hand side uh, a, legit a legitimate journal, the Journal of Applied Physics. And then on the right-hand side, you have two journals, uh, which have really, they're using the same title, but they just have added the word international to it. And again, um, this is, this is, this is the point about predatory publishers is that they want to deceive you, they want to mislead you, and even if you know some of the titles in your field and you recognize some of the title, you may, <coughs> you may not see the difference between them. And then finally, uh, what also characterizes predatory publishers is our problems around editorial and publication practices. Many predatory journals have editorial members who uh, where there are a list of names of academics who have not in fact agreed to be on the editorial board of that journal. We've discovered many examples. There are some uh, of the project journals where the members of editorial boards list the same individuals across five, 10 journals. They sometimes don't provide any information on the editor. 
uh, and uh, they are inappropriate references to publications. So you must also, if you really want to do your own detective work, go to the website of the journal. If you don't find the name of an editor or uh, proper information about an editorial board, it's another sign that you're probably dealing with a prejudice journal. So in the last few minutes that I have, let me make two points. How did we get to this point? What, what is the driver be, behind predatory publishing? And um, there's three things that I think work together uh, that get us to a situation where uh, predatory publishing is still widely prevalent across the planet. The one is that uh, at most of your universities, we have a culture of performance appraisal and management uh, that has become part of our academic culture <clears throat> and where what is being rewarded in academia is how many publications you produce, not necessarily the quality. So I'll come back to that. The second thing is that in many countries they have put in place incentive and reward systems that have led to unintended consequences. <clears throat> My apologies. And finally, uh, one thing that we should be clear about is that open access publishing that is not the cause of predatory journals. Uh, some bill has been accused of making that statement. However, when open access online printing re replaced uh, 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 you know, traditional print journals, it opened the way for uh, predatory publishers and created opportunities for fraudulent and unethical practices. So we must understand that the reason why this is a recent phenomenon is linked to the, uh, the digital publication of journals. And um, I'll, I'll skip this, but I, I just want to elaborate on the first point is that when you have this, these things coming together, when you have a proliferation of online journals, digital, people are now talking about 30, 40, 50,000 journals, um, and of course, thousands of them, Beale at some point said there were 22,000 predatory journals. If you have that amount of journals that cater for unsuspecting authors, and you work at a university where academic performance is equated with counting your number of articles and where your performance and your promotion and appointment as a uh, academic depends on um, metrics like the H index, uh, which really just combines your publications and your citations. It is not surprising that we have a system here where the, the opportunity to publish in these journals and the temptation, I should say, to publish in these journals, together with the forces at in our university education sector that rewards you for publishing as many papers as possible, rather than to publish in high college journals, you have a recipe for disaster. I call this arismomania. You can read what I talk about there. One of my colleagues uh, here at Stellenbosch uh, at, in South Africa, Kian Tomaselli, has just published a book where he talks about agedementia. And I'll just quote from that. He says, if you look at the second part of the slide, sadly, universities have become factories and academics incorporated into the publication conveyor belt. Universities are ranked, researchers are rated, and sometimes re roughed up by managerialism. So we are turned into cocks who must meet preset outputs uh, and who may be lower ranked with less publications and fewer degrees. So my final point about this is about consequences. And uh, just uh, two or three slides and then uh, I'm done. The one is that we must understand and that if you, if you publish in a predatory journal, whether you knew beforehand um, that this was a predatory journal or not. We have done studies on this. I've done a study with one of my PhD students from Ghana who looked at publishing uh, by PhD candidates in predatory journals. And all of them indicated in the interviews that they didn't know that this was a predatory journal. Their supervisor didn't know, but it turned out later to be a predatory journal. And now you sit with a situation that on your CV, you have four, five, six, seven uh, articles that very clear to any committee are in predatory journals. And that can have a huge impact on your academic career. Just think about the situation where you apply for a position at a university or you are at the university and you're 
are considered for promotion. And the committee looks at your CV and says, oh, we see that out of your 20 uh, articles, half were published in preemptive journals. And then uh, that, that puts you on the spot. And it basically uh, means that there's uh, the suspicion that you have acted unethically, even though you may not have known about this. So the first consequence of this is very often at the individual level, and we must uh, realize that. But it also impacts on institutions and science systems, because if too many academics at the same university continue to publish in predatory journals and also engage in other un uh, unethical publication practices, it starts to reflect badly on the reputation of the university and ultimately erosion of trust erosion of trust in the standing of the uh, and reputation of that university. And also, basically, you have to say it will spill over to the perception of that university by key role players, alumni funders, and ultimately the general public. So finally, and this is really addressed at the young scholars on this webinar, the students, the postdoctoral fellows, what advice do I give to my students or young scholars about predatory publishing? some very basic rules. First is, when you are approached uh, to submit a paper to any journal, be suspicious. Uh, I, I, I know that this might sound strange, but you have to be careful because that's not normal practice. Secondly, consult a senior colleague for advice. Look for the, the signs, the characteristics that I've outlined above, and then try and look at the titles that appear in the uh, accepted indexes like the Web of Science Scopus and the Directory of Open Access Journals. In the remainder of this presentation, we have given you a list of additional resources. You can look for a list of priority journals uh, that have continued after Bill closed his uh, website. And there's a whole list of this, and there's a whole set of references that you can also consult. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Johan. That was very clear, illuminating and practical. Um, so if you have any questions around that, please add that to the Q&A um, box and we will get to those um, at the end of the session. So we'll hand over now to, to Vim. I see you've got your, your slides up. And uh, so now we'll be looking uh, from the Scopus perspective. What is the impact on Scopus and how do we address that? Thanks, Vim. Thank you, Lucia, and also thank you, uh, Professor Mouton, um, about on the introduction on uh, predatory journals. What I need, would like to do is the impact on Scopus itself and how in the Scopus database we ensure that we avoid covering uh, predatory journals in the database. Um, so I will start with a, a general introduction on Scopus and um, how we cover high quality content. Then I'll go over the um, catching the bad or predatory journals and I'll end with some general advice, uh, recommendations and useful resources. First, this is the mission that we have at Scopus. Help the world of research make high value decisions with confidence. When we build Scopus and we provide the, um, the tools and the content in the database, this is what we have in mind. Making sure that users of the database can make those decisions and can trust the data which is in there and provided in the Scopus database. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that whatever is covered in the Scopus database can be trusted and that it is organized in such a way um, that you can um, track, analyze and visualize scholarly research. In Scopus, we cover content, books, conferences, and journals from more than 7,000 publishers from all over the world. In total, we have more than 81 million items uh, covered in the Scopus database that are all linked to each other through uh, 1.7 billion citations. The content is organized in such a way that we have profiles of authors, so people who published or are on the uh, bylines of those articles. 70 million author profiles are currently available in Scopus. And also we have um, affiliation profiles, so which institutions um, are mentioned on those papers. And 80,000 of those institution profiles are also available in Scopus. With that, via Scopus, it is uh, possible to find out what research has been done, who has been doing that, and at which institution that research has been done. And with that data model, it is possible to do those um, uh, analyses and visualizations and making those decisions about research. 
So how do we make sure that whatever is covered in the scope of database can be trusted and is high quality? We are doing that via this um, content selection advisory board. Uh, you can see a picture of them here on the screen. And those um, people are experts in different subject areas and come from all over the world. We also have one board member, Jaya Raju, um, coming from University of Cape Town, responsible for multidisciplinary journals and um, uh, information science journals. And, and so we have uh, different people from all over the world in all of these um, subject domains that make decisions about which journals are included in Scopus and which are not included in Scopus. They have a whole list of selection criteria they use for that. I won't have time to go into details today, but on the bottom of this slide, and uh, you'll get the slides after the presentation as well, uh, you can find a link to more information about the selection criteria for journals that the Content Selection Advisory Board is using. So what is the mandate or authority of Scopus or the CSAB? So we are committed to make sure that, um, the, that we create a, a representative data set that is curated. So not all of the journals that exist will be included in Scopus. No, they will only be in Scopus if they're selected by the Content Selection Advisory Board. And that review is done on a journal level. So the board looks at the characteristics of that particular journal, the content that is being published in the journal, the publishing standards that they're using, and also ethical standards that the uh, journal is using. So with that, we're also monitoring uh, journals that um, are below those standards and also deselecting journals that do not need the quality standards anymore. What Scopus does not do um, is interfere with the editorial autonomy of the journals themselves. So we don't look at the editorial decisions or quality of individual articles or conferences that are published in the serial title or the content itself of the articles that are published in the journal or any plagiarism or publication or practice that is happening for the individual articles themselves. It doesn't mean um, that um, those uh, publication or practice um, are not bad and uh, should not happen, um, but if they are on the article level or individual author level, that is an issue for the journals themselves to take to into account or the authors to take into account, and Scopus will not interfere in those kind of decisions. Only if that is on a structural basis and it basically impacts the complete level of the uh, journal itself, then that may be a reason to discontinue the journal altogether. So now going into the topic of the bad or predatory journals. Um, I think this is a slide that I don't have to spend much time on. Um, I think Professor Mouton gave a very good description on uh, the issues around predatory journals itself and predatory publishing, and also the difficulties of how defining it. Um, um, it was also mentioned as the Ottawa Declaration on the definition of uh, predatory uh, journals, and that's also a definition that is being uh, taken into account by the Content Selection Advisory Board and the Scopus Product Team to have some guidance of what, what does it mean uh, when we talk about predatory journals. So how does um, Scopus address the issue? Scopus and the CSAB takes the responsibility of curating content on an ongoing basis uh, to make sure um, that low quality or predatory journals are being avoided and being discontinued uh, in the Scopus database. For that, we're doing continuous monitoring uh, in combination with, with re-evaluation. And that re-evaluation is done by the Content Selected Advisory Board, and they take the same selection criteria as they use for the new journals, but then apply it on the journals that are already in Scopus to make sure that the journals still meet those high quality selection criteria. And if not, those journals will be discontinued. When we get concerns about journals, those need to be validated uh, that we, that, uh, in order to make sure that uh, we as the Scopus team and also the CSAB take a well-informed decision. That's often com complex and it takes time. And often we need to uh, really take our time to um, investigate those cases to make sure um, that we uh, discontinue the, the right journals or the bad journals and don't um, compromise um, the integrity of journals that um, are actually genuine. So therefore those decisions should not be taken lightly um, and um, to avoid that um, we um, exclude genuine journals or good articles that are published in bad journals. 
So these are two examples of journals that have come back. The first example is a medicine journal that was published by a major publisher um, uh, in a, and was covered in the Scopus database since 2014. Then around 2020, the journal got transferred from this major publisher to another um, less well-known publisher um, that was quite relatively new um, and didn't have the same kind of quality standards. They took over the journal title and the ISSM, but it did make a lot of changes to, for example, the editorial board, but also the type of authors that were publishing in the journal and also the content itself changed um, and were not in line anymore um, with the aims and scope of the original journal. With that, the quality of the articles published in the journal has gone down. And in 2021, also the decision was made by the Content Selection Advisory Board to discontinue this journal as it was not credible anymore and not uh, related to the original um, uh, aims and scope of that particular journal. The second example I'd like to mention is an engineering journal, um, which um, was included in Scopus in 2018, was selected for uh, Scopus uh, in that year. Um, and uh, around that time, it published 300 articles per year in the field of engineering. Um, and, they, uh, and the journal did meet the selection criteria as applied by the Content Selection Advisory Board. After it was included in Scopus in 2018, you could see that the um, uh, performance of the journal really changed. All of a sudden, uh, the um, volume of articles increased to more than 5,000 articles published per year. And also the topics of the articles published in the journal were not in line anymore with the original aims and scope of the journal. And also the diversity of the authors, which was okay at the time that the journal was selected for Scopus, really changed and became uh, much um, poorer. And therefore, in 2020 or 2000, at the end of 2019, the decision was made to discontinue this journal for Scopus coverage as well. Uh, as well. It may be uh, debatable if these journals are uh, predatory or not, and if they, these really um, meet those um, definitions um, that also Professor Mouton talked about um, when you look at predatory journals. But I think what can be said about these journals, these two journals, and which is really clear, that these do not meet the quality criteria anymore for Scopus, and therefore have been discontinued for Scopus coverage. So how do we do this? How can we make sure that we catch those journals and that we reevaluate those and make decisions to discontinue those journals from the Scopus database? For that, we have a ongoing monitoring process to make sure that we flag journals that um, uh, should be sent to reevaluation by the CSAB. And we have four methodologies um, for that. The first one is looking at publication, uh, more practice, uh, publication concerns. And these concerns are usually coming from the uh, research community, stakeholders from the Scopus database, but also ourselves, the Scopus team or the CCB, if there are concerns about particular journals, about their publishing standards or pub publication ethics in the, uh, happening in that journal, that could be a good reason to flag those journals for re-evaluation. The second category is about underperforming journals. And underperforming based on the output that the journal has and citations that the journal receives. And um, we um, look at these journals compared to other journals in their fields. Um, and if we see that a journal is underperforming compared to their peer journals, that would also be a reason to flag those journals for uh, re-evaluation. The third category um, is outlier performance. And we use here a tool that we call radar. And then you look, really look at the performance of that journal, again, compared to other journals that are already in Scopus in their fields and see um, how that performance is maybe different or outliers in the sense that uh, there may be a growth of the number of articles, there may be a change in the author affiliation, there may be strange things happening with the citation behavior, and all of those things all together could be a reason that there's outlier performance and that would be a reason to flag those journals for uh, for um, re-evaluation as well. And a fourth category we call continuous curation. And that really has to do with what do we know about those journals at the time that those journals are being selected for the Scopus database? And could it be a reason to look at those journals again after some time? For example, the board may have 
and made an indication when they reviewed the journal that at that point in time, the journal meets the quality criteria, but they don't know if that will be sustainable. And after a few years time, the journal will still meet those selection criteria. And therefore that could be a reason to flag already those journals for re-evaluation at the later point in time. So those are the four mechanisms of how we flag journals for re-evaluation. It doesn't mean that all of those journals that are flagged here are also predatory. Um, it's not a um, binary decision if something is predatory, but also some journals may not meet the quality criteria anymore, may have poor quality, but are not necessarily predatory journals. But again, I don't think that is really the point here that, the, that we as Scopus find journals that are considered predatory. I do think that it's very important that we that we filter those journal, uh, journals out, but find all of the journals that do not meet the quality criteria anymore and remove them from the Scopus database. So in this figure, um, schematically, I'll show how it works. So the, the Scopus database is monitored, monitored on a continuous basis. And with those four main mechanisms that I just mentioned, we can flag journals for the evaluation. If those journals that are flagged for re-evaluation, they are sent to the content selection advisory board, they review those journals uh, in detail and make a decision if those journals continue to be covered in the database or are discontinued for Scopus coverage. So with that, they curate ongoing the whole corpus of the Scopus data set to make sure that the content in uh, Scopus is um, of high quality. And here you can see some results of um, that re-evaluation process in the past five years. And there you can see that about 1,000 titles have been flagged for re-evaluation. And you can see for the different four categories how many journals have been uh, flagged in those categories. And then underneath you can see in orange the number of journals that have been discontinued, and in gray the number of journals that uh, the decision has been made to continue that journal for um, Scopus coverage. So this again comes down to what I earlier said. Not all of those journals that are flagged for re-evaluation in the end are also being discontinued because the decision about um, stopping journal, stop the coverage uh, of journals in Scopus is not based on those concerns that we are having or the flagging me mechanisms that we apply. No, the decisions ultimately are made by, by this independent content selective privacy board using the Scopus selection criteria. You can also see that some of the flagging mechanisms are a bit more successful or have a higher catch rate than others, such as the publication concerns, and those are mostly those predatory journals. There you can see that the discontinued rate, rate is uh, almost 70%, whereas at continuous curation all the way at the right, um, there the discontinued rate is much lower with 16%. So what happens with journals um, uh, when a decision is made to discontinue? Um, and I think there might be a poll coming up now on your screen to get your feedback on this point as well. So when um, the decision is made to um, discontinue a journal, that means that no new content is added to the Scopus database. So from the moment of the decision going forward, no new content will be added to Scopus. Content that is already indexed in the Scopus database will remain, and there's good reasons for that. To keep the scientific record and make sure that the metrics that we have in Scopus remain stable, but also other products that use uh, the Scopus data sets. But also, not all of the articles that are published in a predatory journal are also uh, can, can be considered to be um, predatory or bad quality. But also, journals that have been selected for Scopus at a certain point in time did meet the selection criteria and were at a certain quality level. Only they turn bad or turn predatory at a later point in time, and then they're discontinued, and then no more content will be added. But the content that was already in Scopus until the moment that they find out that a journal turned bad will remain there as a matter of scientific record. There are some exceptions with everything. So in some cases, we may remove some content if there are severe cases of unethical publication practice, but in general, the content will remain. 
Um, and um, here you can see a, uh, a snapshot of the scope of the elsevier.com uh, Scopus info site. And there you can see also a list of the discontinued journals. And that list um, I would like uh, yeah, to advise to refer to if you want to, to know which journals are being discontinued to Scopus, because that gives a complete overview of all the journals that have been discontinued for Scopus coverage and also the flagging mechanism by which they were identified are indicated over there. And these uh, are- uh, Sorry, one, one, can we just pause and do a, a just do a oh, quick poll? There, there is the um, poll coming up. Um, and uh, so in this poll, uh, we would like to have your feedback on um, how you think we should handle um, those uh, journals that um, are discontinued for scope. Do you already have the feedback, Lucia? Uh, the fee, um, we are at 42% uh, voted. Okay. Maybe I continue with the presentation and people that have not voted yet can do that uh, while I'm talking. Um, so here we can see some um, quotes from uh, members of the Content Select Advisory Board um, and also endorsements of that process that I just described on re-evaluation. And um, I think this also um, is testament of how important this process is and how um, also difficult um, it is to find those journals um, in the Scopus database. So it's not a binary decision you can see in that first quote. Um, and there's a number of parameters that need to be considered often in combination. I think that also um, is quite clear from that earlier uh, presentation from Professor Mouton, um, in which there's many indications that could lead to um, um, finding predatory journals, but not necessarily everything that happens makes also sure that a journal is uh, also predatory. So you have to look that into a, um, uh, in, uh, it's a broad spectrum, um, having different parameters uh, in taking into, into account, and it's not a binary decision. And also that second quote, I think that that um, is testament also to how um, important it is to remove predatory journals um, from uh, the Scopus database, but that is less clear what to do with those articles that are published in those journals. Um, and that is also towards the poll that, that we just uh, showed and also to what I mentioned earlier. If um, a journal is discontinued, it doesn't mean that all of the content that was published in the journal before also is bad science um, or should be removed from the Scopus database. And I'd like to end with some um, recommendations and advice. Um, and um, I think this also has been said before, but um, I think it's good to um, uh, to reiterate. The consequences of choosing a bad journal for uh, your good work are really big. Um, and it's something that you really have to think about when you, um, when you select a journal um, for, um, your, for publishing your research or, su or submit your manuscript to. So you have to do your due diligence on those journals. There are several tools available. Think, check, submit is one, um, and there's a link to that uh, on this slide mentioned here. But what it basically comes down to, um, use a checklist and look at all those characteristics of a journal, such as the editorial boards, such as the journal website, such as the APCs and the clarity or transparency around that. And those are all indications that should help you to decide if that's a journal that you can trust or that you not can trust. And also you have to have the right reasons to, sub to submit to the right journal. That a journal is included in Scopus or some other other day to days itself is not a sole reason for submitting your manuscript to that journal. There's also other aspects that you have to take to, into account. Is that journal publishing in the subject area that is relevant for your research? Is it reaching the right audience for your research? Um, and is it a journal that you can trust, published by a publisher that you can trust? All those things you have to take into aspect to, into aspect to make sure that uh, you send your research to the right journal for the right, uh, right reasons. And when in doubt, 
don't do it. That would be my advice. Choose a different journal. There's hundreds of thousands of journals out there. And there's always a journal that does meet your uh, criteria, that can be trusted, that is in your subject area, that has the most effect for your research, and that is also indexed in the right um, indexing services. Um, and with that, um, I think I will um, hand over to uh, back to Lucia, and uh, maybe we have some time for questions. Uh, thank you, Vum. Um, we have actually uh, run out of time. We have ended um, these videos. Have a, a special license. We are only uh, we can only run them for 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 one hour if it is such a um, large audience. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do any questions now. But I do see that we have in the Q and A box we have 14, 15 questions. I'm sure we can respond to them um, by email. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that we have to end um, you know, so ab abruptly, uh, but I want to really thank you, Vim. I want to thank you, Professor Maton, Marty, for uh, doing the preparation for the session. It was really, you can see uh, in the comments, in the, in the chat, it was really appreciated. It was illuminating. It was practical. Uh, Vim, you also added a lot of perspective about um, the difficulty it is for us. Um, and the measures that we take to make sure that we don't have predatory journals in Scopus. Um, so with that, unfortunately, we have to end the session. I really want to thank the audience um, for your participation, for being interactive, adding your, um, your chats, um, asking your questions, and uh, uh, we'll get back to you on all of those. Also for the team, the other panelists, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Um, and then I hope that we'll be back um, soon again with another interesting webinar for you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much.